let me start with a short story. When, when I was born, and this turns now 50 years this year, um, there was nearly no digital data around. So um, everything was analog. There was some, some digital data somewhere in some large companies or governments, but uh, not for ordinary people. Then uh, in 2000, when my uh, daughter was born, um, we bought our first digital video camera. Uh, and we take our first digital videos and uh, we collected a lot of uh, digital, well, not from the today's perspective, but from, from then a lot of digital data. Um, and if you to think of that between 2011 and 2013, there was 90% of the data produced, so new data produced in two years, and before there was nearly nothing, then you can imagine how um, exponential growth uh, looks like. And um, so from my perspective, um, in the last 30 years, let's say, uh, we really had um, a growth of, uh, I call it digital world, in parallel to our physical uh, real world. And uh, so let me just give an overall picture of how those technologies we are speaking today um, can convert into this world. And uh, I said, we took a lot of uh, um, digital uh, pictures. So on one side, uh, we collect nowadays a lot of um, digital data from our physical world. We're sensing, we're sensing, we have cameras all around us, um, uh, 2D mostly, but in future also 3D. Um, speech recognition all around us, uh, on our mobile, everywhere. Uh, so we transfer these images, uh, speech into the digital world. Um, IoT sensors are rising, so we collect more and more data about our surrounding about uh, temperature, humidity, but everything about location. Um, and I don't know who of you have one of those. So uh, we also collect data about our health, um, about our location into this digital world. But also the other way around. So the, the digital world um, gives us access to it, so everybody's uh, looking into the digital world where he's displayed to his laptop um, or and in future even immersive uh, like augmented reality or virtual reality where we can step into this digital world. We have chatbots speaking with us. Um, I don't know who of you have Alexa at home. So you speak with the digital world um, and even if you Think and 3D printing and robotics, there are digital models that generate physical objects in our real physical world. And robots are drones who manipulate our physical world. And then if we step into this digital world, we have artificial intelligence. And for the non-IT people, it's like the brain of the digital world um, that thinks, that learns out of this data, and even takes decisions. And uh, we have a lot of databases collecting those data. And uh, so the, the keyword for the, the last years was big data. So we have the chance in the digital world to really remember very good what happened. And if you think of it, uh, then in the digital world, there are other physical rules than in our physical world. Because unfortunately, you can only be here today. You can't be in London or uh, in Singapore or in New York. But in the digital world, you can now go to, let's say, Paris and uh, take Google Street View and walk around the, the streets. And in the next second, you can be in Hong Kong and walk around there. So location has another meaning in the digital world than in our real world. Also time. So we have time here, and unfortunately, time runs. But um, 
in the, in the digital world, you can just rewind it, and if you collect all this information, also 3D information, I could step back 10 minutes and walk around this room and transfer me in, uh, in the past, and with simulation, I can also transfer in the future. So there are the rules around, and um, now coming to, to blockchain and tokenization, um, we, have, we have assets in our real world. And what's now happening is we like to transfer these assets also in the digital world. But uh, as there are other rules in the digital world, um, the digital world, I can just copy anything. So I can, I can take a, a geometry and just copy it a hundred, a thousand, a million times, which I can't do in the real physical world. But now that, it, that this asset keeps its value, uh, I need something that uh, makes it unique, it also in the, in the digital world. And there, tokens come in. So something I can't just copy that, uh, that has some value to me. And also, and that's more from a, uh, from a construction uh, point of view, the so-called digital twin uh, gains on momentum. Because I like to have a, the object in the digital world, and I want to not only have his geometry, but also his physical uh, abilities, its movement, and simulate this. And therefore, I like to build a digital twin in this, in this digital world, which is just the same as, um, as in the physical world. And blockchain, as Ludovic uh, started in the beginning, could be a link between it, and a link also uh, for trust in these two worlds. Because uh, in the digital world, as I said, I can copy it, I can simulate, and I think fake news is a, a keyword everybody knows. I can, I can hardly distinguish: is it is it real or is it um, um, is it a fake or a simulation or fiction? Um, but with blockchain, I can try to build this trust. So that's the overall picture, um, and from there, I like to really step into those three technologies uh, we're talking about today. <clears throat> so first of all, tokens. Um, I don't know who of you already bought some, some tokens, right? <laughs> Participated in, in one of those ICO or uh, security uh, token offerings, um, like this study from PwC um, shows that in the last last two years, um, there were an enormous amounts of, of money put into uh, these, um, yeah, let's call it crowdfunding, um, and uh, especially in Switzerland, we, we uh, view a large amount of, of uh, startups uh, going live. It was last year with ICO, now it's switching to, uh, to STO. Um, and also um, for regulation and uh, jurisdiction, um, it's a really hot to topic because um, it grows like from nothing and, uh, and you, you really had to handle it because um, it gets to a, a financial um, yeah, instrument um, and you, you really want um, to regulate it and also <coughs> compare it to, um, to other financial instruments. And you see all the countries are already have some regulations or working on those regulations. And from a, from a technical uh, point of view, uh, one thing you have to, to understand is a token is not a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ether. So a cryptocurrency um, is really linked, built into the blockchain you use. Um, but a token, we understand it, is nothing more than a smart contract. So it's a, a program running on, on the blockchain. Um, and this smart contract just holds who is the token owner and his balance. So it's kind of ledger. And um, you have a, a program, a list with the address of the owner and his balance. And um, 
because uh, Ethereum uh, just gives the, the most uh, uh, or the, the best technology to build this, um, it's the most important platform for token offerings. Because you have smart contracts, you can hold this. You have an underlying cryptocurrency, Ether, where you can buy and sell token, uh, and then transfer it also to uh, fiat currencies. And since I thought you, uh, it's a smart contract, so you can program everything in it. Um, there arose uh, those so-called uh, ERC standards. These are um, Ethereum requests for commands. So some kind of standards how those programs act. And the ERC20 token, that's the most common token because it's like a, a currency. So you can buy, you can sell, um, and it, each token has the same value. Um, and it's like, like in trading, so the value um, uh, is, is calculated from the offer and the demand uh, of this token. So most of the ICOs use this kind of token, but there are also other tokens, uh, like this ERC7021 token, which in comparable to uh, ERC20 is non-fungible. And this means each token has a separate value. So perhaps you know CryptoKitties. Perhaps somebody bought CryptoKitties. Um, that was the, the first really business with a, with a token. Um, it's like a collectible, cats, of course, cats. Um, and each cat has its own ability. So it is born with its ability and this, these attributes give the value. And yeah, each cat looks different, um, and I perhaps prefer some, some pink cat, and therefore I offer more money for a pink cat than for a blue cat, easily speaking. So this is other, other way for tokens, but I don't have to stick to these, uh, to these kind of standards. They are self-given. Uh, I can develop my own smart contract with my own... Uh, abilities and um, I can also implement uh, that the token will burn itself when it's spent or, or everything. So um, you really should have a look into the smart contract and understand what happens with the token um, because otherwise, uh, yeah, it, it's gone and uh, you don't know about it. So that's token, so the, the, the kind of value uh, produced in the digital world. And um, let's now switch to IoT, Internet of Things. And I think the, um, the value stack for IoT is a, is a good point to start. Um, because IoT is not only the, the device that is mounted into this room, for example, this fire sensor over there. Uh, perhaps also has a temperature sensor and humidity sensor in it. So that's the device, the, the lowest level. Um, but IoT or the devices are not only sensors. So they can also be actors. So like a switch, you can switch something. Uh, you can also manipulate something. But the most thing really on uh, of, of sensors if they think on, on IoT. Um, but IoT... Uh, it's nothing without a connection to the internet because it's in its name, uh, Internet of Things. So the device is the thing, and uh, the internet comes with, with this connection. So we have different uh, network types where we can connect our sensors to the internet. And, um, and on this, there, we have a, a whole infrastructure, and it's not only that um, we have a direct connection between the sensor there and the internet, but most time you have some kind of edge computing, so perhaps you have a Bluetooth connection from the sensor to a computer in the room, and he collects the data, also makes the data pre-processing, and then sends this pre-processed data to, for example, via Ethernet or Wi-Fi to the internet. And there, most services collect the data in a cloud infrastructure. That's the easiest way to handle it. So uh, you can have 
the, the whole database somewhere spread in the world and all the sensors can provide their data to this cloud infrastructure and on this infrastructure you can do your main analytics and you can also include different types of, of sensor data. And on top, that's where the value comes, so the, the real application. So far to the, uh, to the cloud infrastructure, we just collect the data, pre-processed it, but afterwards, you really have applications on it. You want to create some data, some, some, uh, some knowledge, some, some value out of it. And this is done on the highest level, and that's there where the business models are. And today, blockchain uh, spans the, the topper areas. Um, so it's, it's mainly um, then in the cloud infrastructure, connecting uh, values over there. Um, and, and also deals with, um, with the, the value creation. But in future, blockchain will spread until the device level. So there are first companies building uh, integrated chips uh, with a blockchain connection. So they will go into the devices, for example, also cars. And then we have the ability to connect the devices directly to some kind of of blockchain. So let's look at some of the, the blockchain use cases. Um, and Ludovic also started with some. I just um, want to go to five use cases. So from my point of view, the, the most valuable and at the moment the, the most companies go in this use case that's uh, supply chain management. Um, because IoT gives you the ability to track assets, to, to track uh, location of asset, where uh, goods are produced, uh, to monitor conditions of assets, um, and then you store it in a blockchain and you, uh, you, you really ensure that it's not tempered, that it's not changed. And also you can ensure where is the origin of this asset. And for example, for uh, medicine or pharmacy, um, there are several use cases where you track, for example, temperature during the, um, the supply chain and also during transportation and ensure that there is no high temperature change which makes the medicine uh, not work again. Uh, and then afterwards you can, can, can guarantee that the temperature is hold. Or you can also guarantee, for example, silk production, which is the farmer who produced the silk. <clears throat> Another big uh, use case is the sharing uh, economy. Um, so you all heard that uh, sharing economy, that's uh, a new hype. Um, if I live in an area, I want to share my goods. I don't want to, uh, to, uh, to buy my drilling machine, I just share it with my neighbor. And um, IoT devices can, on the, other, on the one hand side, detect the state of the, the asset or the object, um, but also it can trigger smart contracts um, if something changes. And, and therefore I can, for example, rent something from my neighbor, and if I give it back to him, I. Um, the, the payment is, is done, so he gets his, uh, his rental and I get my deposit, for example. So there are several companies who are working in this area and also you can think of uh, yeah, the ne next Airbnb where I can just rent my, um, my holiday uh, rooms and to somebody uh, with an IoT device a lock and it just works autonomously for itself, and I just collect the money. <clears throat> but it's not only using the data for, uh, for some, some kind of, um, of uh, process afterwards, we can also sell the data itself. So these IoT sensors, for example, a temperature sensor, I can sell the data to somebody who makes something out of it. Um, and this company perhaps buys temperature data from all over Brussels and makes its, um, 
its models for, um, for weather forecasts or something like this. And with IoT and blockchain in combination, I can sell the data and have a marketplace. And also with tokens, for example, I can then monetize it. I can bring the value to, uh, to this data and somebody can buy the data from me and the, the payment is handled automatically. With all these uh, devices, the IoT devices around, um, it's, there, there's a, a strong need to identify these devices because um, I really make sure that this uh, fire sensor is in this room here and not stolen and somebody else, uh, somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> so I have to identify the object. I also want to make sure that this fire sensor is not uh, placed um, or before was in, in some other environment or sends its data to another environment. And identity is a, a big use case for blockchain. Uh, identity of IoT devices, but in future perhaps also identity of persons. So um, perhaps in future we all have a chip in there and uh, then we will be identified on our blockchain. Um, and we get access uh, to these rooms um, and uh, we are registered and we have the self-sovereign identity. So we are uh, uh, the owner of our data. And finally, <clears throat> automation everywhere where you want to automize uh, something. You, you want to make machines talk to each other. You want um, to, to sense objects that one machine produces and the next one uses, um, there, this combination, IoT and blockchain, can be, um, can be of help, a help because um, it allows the, the machines to make contract with each other. So uh, you have a contract between machines. No human has to interact. Um, so the smart contracts uh, sense where the object is, when it's produced, when it's ready, and then deliver it to the other machine, and the next machine just gets it, and the, the contract is fulfilled. So uh, also in industry, um, there, are smart, uh, there are very uh, big use cases for this uh, combination. Now let's step to artificial intelligence. Um, and I know we have uh, a lot of experts in here, but um, you can, can divide the, the workflow on artificial intelligence in three main uh, aspects. So first of all, as Ludovic pointed out, we need a lot of data. So we have the data collection. The second step is the processing of this data. And the final step is the action we take out of the data or the artificial intelligence takes out of this data. And to show you this, um, there, are, there are several uh, building blocks or core technologies in artificial intelligence, like we all know machine learning, deep learning, uh, language processing, or pattern recognition, but all work the same. So in the first step, you have collection of images, of speech, of what kind of data. In the second, you train your network and uh, the data is processed. And in the final uh, step, the, text, uh, the action is uh, taken. So for example, you, you have a translated speech or you have uh, some, some structure you recognize by image recognition. Um, and so these spread over all those uh, building blocks. And from a use case perspective, where comes blockchain uh, in part? I just want to pick some out of those uh, use cases. So the, the first is uh, democratizing of data. Um, you all know that um, there are large corporates who collect a lot of data, or like Google, Facebook, Apple, just to name some of them. Um, and because they have the data, they can build their artificial intelligence models or networks and can, uh, can use this data. Um, for startups or new companies, it's really hard to get this data. And uh, blockchain can be one possibility for other companies also to 
get this data and for me as data owner to give or sell my data to those companies. Also, if I train my, uh, my network, my um, uh, processing unit, um, I want to ensure that the data is correct. And as I pointed out, uh, in the digital world, it's hard to, to distinguish if the information are real or fiction. And I want to ensure that it's real data. And their blockchain can uh, build trust in the data, authenticize where the data comes from, and that it's the, the real data I train my model on. And finally, um, privacy, self-sovereignty of data, where I'm the owner of my data and I give it away to whoever I want, and it's not that it's gone in the internet. <clears throat> on the processing side, um, blockchain can help to, uh, to explain some decisions. And um, as you might know, artificial intelligence uh, or neural networks are kind of black box. So that makes it really hard for use cases in medicine because um, you, you get, a, uh, get a decision, but you, uh, the network can't explain why it gets this decision. It's just because it's trained this way. Um, and using blockchain can, uh, can help to record all the, the decisions and all the, uh, the steps done in the network and from this point also get some uh, explanations why uh, decisions are made. And finally, on, uh, on the action side, um, I want to, to record what actions uh, have produced. Let's take a self-driving car. Uh, if the self-driving car runs into a wall instead of overruns a person, then I want this decision recorded. I want the car has made the decisions and also the sensor data that leads to this decision. Um, and I also want to ensure that nobody can, can tamper or change this decision afterwards. And their blockchain also uh, can uh, play a, um, a good role in, in ensuring um, this, uh, these decisions. So everything is dealing about trust, building trust, and blockchain is as a trust protocol in this um, uh, in this environment. And if we get back to our first image, the the combination of, of all these technologies in, in a digital world. Um, today we speak of assets bringing value into the digital world, but perhaps tomorrow it's not only that we bring assets into this world, but we also bring ourselves in this world. And uh, might sounds like science fiction, but uh, Companies like Facebook are building real looking avatars in the digital world. And perhaps in two, three, five years, I have my avatar speaking here, so I can stay in Switzerland. And, uh, and uh, the avatar is uh, telling you everything. Uh, perhaps uh, combined with artificial intelligence, the avatar uh, also thinks of itself because he was trained, he learned um, how my decisions are, so he can also uh, be in a meeting and um, yeah, perhaps make some decisions. Um, Google is already uh, making some, um, uh, some hair cutting uh, dates for you, so it's not so far away. Um, and also, uh, I like my identity in the, in the digital world. I like that my avatar is not copied a thousand times. It should only be one of me in the digital world. And there, blockchain can, uh, can take a role. And also, um, I want to, to really know afterwards, after a meeting, what decisions my avatar uh, made and what he sensed and what he, he taught the other people. And uh, I don't want that this uh, is changed by every, uh, somebody. So where are we heading? Uh, look to the future. 
And I want to point out that these are my personal predictions. Um, so I'm convinced that the border between those two worlds will blur. Uh, in future, we will be in both worlds, um, not only looking into some laptop display, but uh, living in parallel with augmented reality devices, so having the real world and the digital world at the same time, or stepping, like in stepping in another room, stepping into the digital world. Um, and the digital world, the exponential growth will continue. I think that's, that's clear to everybody. Moore's law and all these um, predict this. And, um, and in, this, in this world where, um, <clears throat> where IoT and artificial intelligence blockchain is combined, it, uh, it converts and it also uh, gives us a lot of, of additional value if we take those uh, technologies together and don't look at them as silos as it's uh, looked today. From my point of view, the digital twin will become a central figure. Uh, it's not just the three-dimensional uh, representation somewhere around. Um, it's a, a, central, a central object of physical or real-world objects which are tracked by IoT, which, uh, where decisions are made on these objects and where these objects get value via tokens or via blockchain technology. And in this world, trust and value uh, will become essential. Uh, trust into the data, trust uh, into this digital world, and, uh, and value, because um, today value is mostly in the, in the physical world, but tomorrow we need value in the digital world. And to get value there and to get trust into the digital world, blockchain plays a crucial role. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for uh, bringing your uh, academic point of view on, on, on this very uh, interesting topic uh, and, of course, very complex. So thank you very much. I hope that this has clarified uh, some elements in the minds of the people here in the room, and I'm sure it, it has. Uh, just want to let you know that uh, you all received uh, Tim's paper uh, as uh, the Lucerne University is academic partner of the Observatory and Forum. Uh, so uh, if you haven't already, uh, please have a look at this paper. This is a draft version. The final version will be released a few weeks uh, after the workshop. But uh, please, uh, the floor is open for uh, questions. So please ask your questions to, to Tim. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, how, what's your timeline on this? When you see this thing actually come alive in uh, what you see in paper? Because I see a lot of uh, issues be prior to it come alive in, in, in the real world. Oh, we had a, a short chat before. Um, I was also asked when, when this comes alive. Um, hmm, that's really hard to predict uh, because I see several aspects of this world, this digital world, already happening. Um, and uh, as you all know, it, you, th there's a lack on the one hand side to, to really bring everything together uh, because each company has different aspects and they have to, uh, to work together. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of, um, of regulatory and juristic questions uh, behind this, um, and it's hard for, for large companies to, to go in this way, uh, but I see uh, a lot of startups working on this. Um, but speak honestly, um, just predict 10 years. So you all know the singularity is in 2040, so um, now it's 2020. And how are you going to deal with uh, IoT devices, legacy IoT devices that have been 
already built? Are you going to get it onto the blockchain or how are you looking to deal with that already existing IoT devices that white labeled, built in old China, you know, it's not a great security system around it, able to get, you know, how you deal with the, the past to bring it onto the future? Um, I see uh, large companies building IoT devices now thinking of how to bring them on the blockchain, how to bring the identity of those devices, of the new devices on the blockchain. Um, but you will have legacy, like you have legacy system in, in the financial industry, and um, they are around, and perhaps you have trusted data and you have untrusted data. I have a question relating uh, to the security. Some people already see that there could be or there is already something like an I, uh, Internet of Things uh, security nightmare because of many devices uh, that are cheaply produced and that cannot be updated or are not updated. And as I understood from your slides, uh, often for these applications to make them work, we have to rely on, these, on the security of the Oracle, of the, uh, of the sensors, um, because this is what feeds into the system. So I'm worried that uh, the, security, the security will uh, have an even, or the IoT security will have even a larger impact once it is integrated with blockchain. So can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the security perspective? As, as I mentioned, the, um, a lot of companies now work on the security of those IoT devices, but you have already a, a lot of devices that are not secure. And the question is how do you integrate them into the blockchain? Do you just trust them or do you have some verification on, on those devices? And, uh, and the question then would be, um, uh, do you have two types of devices? But if we have like a certification authority, um, isn't this something like a weakest link and then we don't need the blockchain anymore because this certification authority could also be trusted to run the entire database? So, so for the certificate of the, the device, I think, yeah, you have to have a certification authority who gives the certificate and that's built into, into the, uh, the device. But on, you might also like to register the device on a blockchain and you also want to register or uh, record where the device is used and who is the owner of the device and their blockchain really comes into place. Does this answer the question? Not really. <laughs> um, yes, a question about, but we already talked about this, about immutability. So the, the model you show, for, we know the blockchain, we cannot uh, stop it. And here it will play a, a central role in the future digital world. So we can potentially have a world where you will have AI intelligence, we cannot stop uh, anymore. Data, we cannot modify anymore. So this is more a concern about how in the future we have to take care about this uh, immutable automatization uh, model. So this is, I don't know if you already think about this, but yeah, this is more to, to tackle a concern about immutability of this model. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, that's, I think, the, the problem. Today, we, um, we have the problem uh, to trust uh, people, and uh, we, have, we have the problem between people. In future, we will have uh, also the question, can we predict how artificial intelligence or how the whole system develops, and uh, do we have some, some kind of, uh, of emergency plug where uh, we can uh, say, okay, now stop here? Um, uh, there's a lot of potential for research, yes. <laughs> Hi, Arnold Loas from IBM. Um, you define token as a contract, and I take issue with this because uh, in the case of Hyperledger Fabric, we are implementing digital tokens based on UTXO model, which is not a smart contract. And it's not because we don't have smart contracts. We do have smart contracts, too for various reasons, I'm not going to get in details here, and I'm not the expert, but primarily as to do with privacy, um, we have chosen a different model. So I just want to point out, I don't know if you're familiar with 
fab tokens. You might want to look into it. It's a different type of design. And so I think it's a bit restrictive to say that a token is a smart contract. Yes, you're completely right. Uh, in, the, in the business world today, where um, also in, um, in offerings where you have, there's Ethereum. But in consortiums, I think, yes, there, there are different types of, of tokens. You can also produce them in other ways. Thanks for this. Uh, yeah, thanks for your presentation. It follows on nicely from that question, actually, and something you touched upon is the human understanding of what tokens are and what smart contracts are. Um, we work with a lot of vertical industries who are looking to adopt. Excuse can you uh, give your name and affiliation before your question? Oh, sorry, Michael from Logos Yeah, Consultancy. Um, yeah, so we work with a lot of industries who are going to adopt technologies such as blockchain and AI. So... I was just considering they have a variety of needs from what these smart contracts or tokens can execute for their business. So I was just curious what your thoughts were on how standardized these processes are, is are going to be and how that relates to user understanding and business understanding, whether it's going to be more like process driven or sector driven or, you know, just maybe that's a bit much. But. Well, if you, if you take a look and I just, or to the Ethereum world now, uh, if you take a look on the token there and, uh, and the, um, the token standards, there are a lot of new token standards evolving because everybody thinks, well, I can stick to token, I don't know, ERC-7021, but I need an additional feature um, because uh, later on I want to produce new tokens, for example. Um, so... As I see it at the moment, there's a grow in, in different kind of standards. And it's really hard to predict. Do you have then a, a real uh, uh, nightmare of, uh, of different tokens? Or is it uh, that after a certain time, it, comp it, it goes back to several types of tokens? I think that's, that's really hard to predict uh, nowadays. Um, but um, as it's smart contract, you're really open to, uh, to it. And, um, uh, but on the other hand, um, the, the user afterwards um, don't understand the smart contract. Uh, so um, today you, you need your, uh, uh, your lawyer to, uh, to help you with the, the legal contract. Uh, perhaps in, in two or three years, you need a, a computer scientist to help you with the smart contract to understand what's, what's afterwards. And there comes the question um, then of regulation and jurisdiction. Uh, do we um, reduce the tokens to several kind of standards because people have to understand and ensure that uh, how, how tokens behave? But at the moment, it's um, Wild West. <laughs> so... Part of the objective of the EU Observatory uh, is to identify uh, sectors and business models that uh, the EU should promote in order to foster the creation of the technology champions of tomorrow. So if you had to select three to five use cases that you see as most likely to um, uh, surface as real business models, in the next couple of years that the EU uh, should promote to see the emergence of regional champions, <coughs> which use cases would you uh, think of at the intersection of blockchain, IoT, and artificial intelligence? Um, let's get back to um, the IoT slide, if this works. Not so fast. Um, but I see... Um, one use case is supply chain management um, because it tackles a lot of industries um, from healthcare, smart city to production industry. Um, and it's not only IoT and blockchain, but there also can be involved or included artificial intelligence. So that would be one um, of the use cases. Um, a second use case, uh, the, the sharing industry. Um, because also it's, it's not only focusing on, on one industry, it can be used in several industries. Um, 
I think, um, and there the, the question is how deeply involved will be uh, IoT, but uh, the identification and their self-sovereign identity, uh, that's a, a hot topic at the moment. Um, with all use cases built upon this, uh, like for example, we have in the canton of Zug, um, we already have an uh, electronic ID on Uport. Um, so um, people can, that can get their electronic ID and we had the first e-voting on top of this and there are several other use cases now building on top of this. Um, and uh, afterwards to to pick one out is uh, for the for the um, uh, construction or mainly industry the the automatization um, so machine to machine contracts <laughs> and also their IoT and artificial intelligence so that would be four use cases. Um, Ivona Skultaryo from Tilburg University. Thank you for your presentation. I also read uh, the paper. So my first question is related to the use case that you, uh, that you mentioned about the autonomous cars and explainability of AI decisions. And I wonder um, how does blockchain help me actually in that? Because I understand that um, it can help me with the authenticity of the data that are fed to the AI and also help me determine what decision the AI, uh, the AI made. But in terms of explaining the decision, um, how how does that actually work? Because that was that was the first question, and second, short shorter question: the use cases that you point to, or the companies that you point to in your paper, what stage exactly they are in? Is it just the concept stage? Are they doing some prototype, or like where where they are in the in their development? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, the, so the um, explainability of um, uh, of decisions um, can be seen at uh, if you record those um, what the network really does and also the states of the network. So not only the beginning and the end, but also get into deep into the neural network and record what states there then perhaps, but it's not for sure, perhaps you can also uh, explain some patterns uh, of decisions and then uh, you can, can also point on some uh, areas in the network where you can say, okay, uh, this decision or uh, has been done because of this data uh, pattern. That's the, the idea behind this. And um, so the, the examples in the paper that uh, you, you have to, uh, to point on one of the, or, or two of those examples, because they are in, in different stages. Um, um, I don't know which, uh, which company or use case you already have in, in mind. I didn't have a particular example, but maybe if you can point out to one that is really working on a larger scale at the moment and has customers and so on and so forth. So um, I know in, in supply chain management, there, there are several um, startups um, already providing, like Modum in Zurich, they're providing uh, sensors uh, to collect temperature data, and they also have a, a blockchain. I also know Bosch has some, uh, some working use cases. Um, IBM and Musk has built some, some kind of, of uh, tracking of, uh, of goods, for example. In the security area, there, there are uh, also companies, um, if you look at smart contract security, they are already uh, up and running and uh, we'll have a lot of, <laughs> uh, of projects uh, because all the ICOs, they want to ensure that their uh, smart contracts are, um, are working and uh, error prone, just to give some, but perhaps we, afterwards we can uh, point some out. Thank you.